Good evening, everyone, and allow me to welcome you once again to our weekly Africa Healthcare Network Fireside Chats. Uh, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce to you tonight one of the most prominent uh, entities in the field of nephrology in Africa. We would like to start by thanking the International Society of uh, Nephrology, the ISN, for assisting us in organizing this high-impact talk tonight by Professor Mohammed Hani Hafez from Egypt. My name is Dr. Amar Sali. I'm the consultant nephrologist and physician from Shri Hindu Mandal Hospital, Tanzania. And this is the fireside chat number 115. I would just like to briefly introduce our speaker tonight. Prof. Mohammed Hani Hafez is the Emeritus Professor of Medicine and Nephrology in the Cairo University in Egypt. He's also the past president of the Egyptian Society of Nephrology and Transplantation. He is also the Chief of Nephrology Councils of the Egyptian and Arab Boards, the Middle East Councillor of the DICG, and the Secretary General of the Middle East Society of Organ Transplantation, the MESOT. He is also the President of the African Society of Nephrology and Transplantation, the AFRAN, and tonight he is going to be talking to us on the updates in the diagnosis and management of lupus nephritis. Prof. Hafez, it is our Absolute pleasure to host you tonight for this talk, and we thank you very much for taking time out to, to speak to our audience, and we are really looking forward for this exciting talk. Uh, th thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Amar, for this very uh, kind introduction, and it oh, actually it is my great honor and privilege uh, to be uh, sharing in this uh, important scientific activity. Uh, I hope uh, uh, in the next uh, period. Uh, we try to discuss together uh, what is hot and new in the lupus nephritis. Uh, actually, I choose this subject because of two reasons. Uh, you are aware that in the last uh, year, the KDGO has launched uh, new updates in uh, lupus management. Uh, uh, it started in 2021 and then uh, with some uh, little modification in 2023. Again, uh, there are at least three new drugs uh, for the management of lupus after a long period of silence. Uh, we have been uh, bombarded by actually three new FDA products uh, for treatment of lupus that uh, also deserve to be discussed and see if we can use them in our practice. As you know, lupus uh, erythematosus has got different uh, uh, definition. The uh, anti-nuclear antibody should be uh, positive uh, with a titer of 100, uh, of one over 80 or more, uh, plus uh, some uh, criteria scoring at least 10, according to the Joint European League uh, Against Rheumatism and the American College of Rheumatology. And you see here these uh, sort of uh, criteria uh, ranking from uh, 2 to th to 5 to 6 to 10 so if you you, you get 10 points you are uh, uh, you can be diagnosed as lupus for uh, renal lupus or lupus nephritis prote proteinuria more than half gram per 24 hour ranks 4 uh, renal biopsy uh, 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 ranks from 8 to 10 so uh, a positive biopsy actually is enough uh, but a positive proteinuria alone needs some addi additive uh, criteria from the, uh, the right side, which is the complement proteins, for example, low C3 or low C4, anti-double-stranded DNA. So if we, we gather these together, uh, we have the diagnosis of lupus nephritis. Uh, again, lupus nephritis is important because it it has it carries significant morbidity and mortality to our patient. Within 10 years of an initial lupus diagnosis, 5 to 20% of the patient develop end-stage kidney disease. And we are aware that our patients on dialysis, when they have lupus, they also uh, there is higher risk of this. Uh, accordingly, uh, we are trying to decrease the number of lupus flare, because as you know, the lifespan of a normal kidney could, according to this uh, gradual de uh, deterioration of the GFR with age, it could survive a normal kidney for 100 years or even 100, 
uh, more than 100 up to 120 years but with each time you have a lupus flare there is some nephron loss and decrease in this uh, lifespan of the kidney and therefore we should minimize as much as possible the number of activities or the number of lupus flare the clinical diagnosis as you are aware has got a, a, a picture of everything a nephrotic picture or a nephritic picture proteinuria hematuria so lupus is a great mimicker with a telescopic urine uh, uh, the, in which you you may have any of the pattern of nephrology uh, on uh, clinical and laboratory ground. Uh, what are the important prognostic factor? Of course, the number of nephron, if adverse, is small, will add to the problem. Uh, in uh, the, the number of uh, lupus uh, disease activity, as I told you, the more number of activities uh, or the more number of layers, the shorter the, half, the, the life of the kidney. Some genetic factor drive CKD progression. Genes that modify the risk uh, include Apple one MYH9, uh, UMOD, and podocytopathy genes, and we'll come to this in, in a minute. Again, uh, uh, single nephron hyperfiltration. Uh, of course, uh, whenever you have a part of the nephron uh, which is fibrosed, the, remain, uh, the remaining nephron undergo compensatory hyperfiltration to accommodate the filtration load and this will increase the progression of disease. Uh, uh, added to this, if the patient takes, uh, unfortunately, some nephrotoxic drugs, such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, heritability actually is polygenic, like many other diseases. It is not a single uh, gene. But uh, uh, in the first uh, degree uh, relative, uh, you may find uh, lupus in around 6%. Uh, this polygenicity uh, has been uh, studied by the GWAS study, and they found that there are so many genes uh, uh, that uh, are responsible for the lupus, at least more than 80 genes are associated. Several of them uh, are uh, related to type 1 interferon production, B cell and T cell signaling uh, and function, inflammation, all these have been implicated and still the genetic uh, makeup of lupus is increasing with more studies. Uh, an important emerging uh, concept, as you know, the uh, ratio of female affection versus male affection is more in lupus, up to eight to nine uh, in female versus male. And the explanation for this is because there is a double dose of genes present on the X chromosome that may increase the susceptibility of females to have lupus more than males. The pathophysiology actually is, uh, uh, I, I, this is a simplified, but I will give a, a more complicated figure after that. This is a, a simplified uh, story. We have a sort of initial autoantibody uh, directed against the nucleosome arising from the apoptotic cells. And these nuclear debris induce dendritic cells. Here, the dendritic cells are very important. They produce interferon uh, alpha, uh, which is a potent inducer of the immune system. Uh, and there will be then T and C and B cell interaction, uh, release of some interleukins, uh, and uh, plasma cells will be activated to pro produce autoantibodies. These autoantibodies will be responsible for all the picture that I mentioned, including the tubular atrophy, activation of the antigen-presenting cells, mesangial cells, endothelial podocytes, and uh, different aspects that end maybe by fibrosis. This is a, a, a little bit more complicated cartoon uh, that has been published in Nature in 2020. Uh, starting uh, the story by generation uh, of endogenous chromatin. This endogenous chromatin uh, uh, activation of the mature dendritic cells, and uh, also will uh, this dendritic cell will, with in, will interact with the T cell and the B cell to produce uh, T helper 17, uh, activate the macrophage and the plasma cells, 
which actually uh, end by more and more uh, uh, in immune complex formation and deposition on the glomerular site and lupus nephritis. And this is the same cartoon, but uh, a little bit uh, more enlarged. The question here, if this is the pathophysiology of lupus involving so many uh, molecules, could we have uh, some more recent biomarkers, uh, not only the classic biomarkers that I, I started my talk with, I mean, the proteinuria, the C3, C4 consumption, could we go for more biomarker? Uh, maybe you will start, I will uh, just skip this and go uh, uh, back after that. What is wrong with traditional lupus biomarkers? Why we are trying to, to find new biomarkers? Because proteinuria is most frequently measured, but not specific for activity and increases after the kidneys sustain chronic injury. Uh, I mean, uh, it is not a very accurate marker, the proteinuria. Again, the GFR is used mainly to monitor the chronic kidney damage and uh, the anti-double-stranded DNA and the hypocomplementemia, although they are uh, good uh, marker for the activity, but again, uh, they cannot uh, predict the future flares. And similarly, anti-C1Q antibody have modest sensitivity and specificity for clinically defined lupus, but have never been tested against histology. Uh, let's go back after knowing the need to get new biomarker and see if this could be present in the serum or in the urine. Yes, in the serum, we could, we could measure uh, the uh, BAF, the April proliferation-inducing ligand, the MBL or the mannose-binding le lectin, soluble interleukin-7 receptor, cystatin C, and interleukin-18. These are potential serum markers. Uh, more important, actually, are the urinary biomarkers. And... Uh, special uh, uh, mentioning about uh, urinary CD163. This is a novel non-invasive biomarker that I will speak to you within minutes. Uh, we have uh, the monocyte chemoattractant protein in urine, the tweak, tumor, uh, 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 TNF-like weak inducer of apoptosis, the N-gal, the vascular cellular adhesion molecule 1, and the bath again. You will ask me, uh, uh, why, why not, why not uh, to depend on the biopsy only? Why, why going to this biomarker? Actually, biopsy, of course, is uh, important for the initial diagnosis. It is the best diagnostic tool, but repeating biopsy so much to, for, for in each flare uh, is not a solution. And in the same time, uh, repeating biopsy will, may show us shift from one uh, class to another class uh, of lupus, and therefore they are trying now to go for this new biomarker to uh, pretend or to, to get a knowledge of which patient will respond and which patient will not respond. I will give you three examples here. The urine CD163 that I spoke to, to you uh, showed that he, the level decrease in response to therapy but remain persistently elevated in patients who do not respond. So we, we may uh, get an idea about uh, a marker which correlates very well instead of repeating the kidney biopsy, if the patient will respond to therapy or not. Uh, another important mar marker is the urinary monocyte chemotactic protein. Again, it, uh, this found to have persistently high level of urine uh, if the patient is unresponsive. So if the patient is unresponsive to treatment, you will see that uh, both monocyte chemotactic protein 1 is high and urine uh, CD163 will be high, will not decrease. We have other two uh, markers, the serum uromodulin, which is lower in patients with kidney involvement than in those without kidney disease. And this is an important aspect because not every lupus patient will get lupus nephritis. So by the serum uromodulin, you may expect the, the people who will get renal affection and lupus nephritis. Again, the urine EGF level are lower in patients with previous lupus nephritis than in patients without previous lupus nephritis. So you may correlate historically if the patient 
got before or not by measuring the urine EGF. So these in the future are very promising. And of course, any urine biomarker is easy to measure. Uh, another advantage is actually looking to the single cell RNA sequencing, which is a, a new uh, era in medicine in general, applied here in the analysis of the uh, renal biopsy. So in the renal biopsy, you may not only see what the glomeruli, the tubules, the vessels, but you may go a little bit more and see different uh, subsets of immune cells. And here, uh, an example of 22 different subsets of immune cells that has been uh, studied in cases of lupus. Some of them ad address the monocytes, the CD4, the CD8, natural killer cells and B cells, and most of which were absent from healthy kidney. So you can differentiate the healthy kidney from the lupus kidney by the presence of these different subsets of immune cells by single cell transcriptomics. Uh, another, uh, and this is an example of the proteomics used in lupus nephritis. So the vision of how lupus management uh, renaissance will be in the future could be by getting a urine sample or a blood sample. And uh, as we are looking in uh, a, 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 a bowl of a glass, you can predict which patient will respond to the treatment or will not respond to the treatment, which patient will develop lupus nephritis or which patient with lupus will remain without lupus nephritis by simply measuring uh, some of the molecules like urine moduline that I told you about and see if there is a response or not. And also you can measure the response to the different drugs that I will mention in a minute by these uh, molecules. Uh, now let's go to the second part of my talk, which will be responsible about the treatment. As you know, the KDEGO clinical practice guideline for the management of lupus nephritis has been published uh, in March 2023, actually last month. And over the past year, at least uh, three drugs by the U American US Food and Drug Admin uh, Administration has been approved for the treatment of lupus. This is actually making a new renaissance or a new revolution in the management of lupus. And also uh, the biomarkers that I just mentioned. Now let's go to the cartoon, the initial cartoon that I told you about, uh, antigen presenting cell, T cell, B cell, plasma cells, uh, release of antibodies. All these aspects will be affected by the drugs uh, either the classic drugs that we are using since long time uh, or the new drugs that I will be discussing. So you can see, for example, that some of these uh, drugs here, the CNIs, are uh, uh, actually working here in this area. Uh, uh, and we, have, we know that the tacrolimus, the neural, and other drugs can work here. Some drugs will work at this uh, part. Uh, whether they are effective or not effective, we'll discuss later on, like the abatacept, for example, uh, in the co-stimulation molecule. Some drugs are acting on the B cell, which we see here the CD20, and we have at least two drugs, the rituximab and its refinement, or the second generation after the rituximab, which is called the obinituzumab. We have also uh, other uh, drugs which are affecting the, uh, an, an important part of the B cell, which is the soluble uh, uh, BAF. Uh, and here we find the, our new friend that I will discuss in detail later on, the bilumumab, which is acting on the B cell. Uh, some drugs will work on here, affecting the plasma cell and the proteasome. And here we'll be speaking about some uh, aggressive management like the portizomib, for example, in resistant cases. Uh, again, we are trying to decrease the extent of fibrosis by maybe using uh, uh, serolimus. Uh, and of course, in all these steps, the steroids uh, has been uh, present as a golden tool since very long time. So uh, the lupus, uh, uh, at the time of lupus diagnosis, you start by uh, seeing if the serum creatinine is normal or high. 
and uh, you measure the urine protein if it is less than half gram or more than uh, half uh, gram. If it is more than half gram, this mandates a kidney biopsy. If it is less than half gram, uh, you can uh, uh, you can uh, consider biopsy if there are other signs of activity of lupus, and then you will treat accordingly. And I will come to this later with detail because the new KDGO guideline has uh, changed a little bit the paradigm. But we, as you see here, the RAS blockade is present in all classes, class one, two, class three, four, class five, and it is not present, of course, in class six, in which the, six, uh, the CKD management is uh, the, the case. Hydroxychloroquine is present in all uh, uh, classes. CNI or glucocorticoids are present if urinary protein excretion is more than one gram. And then uh, in class three and four, you add uh, 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 more immunosuppression that will come in detail afterwards. Uh, also in class, in class five, if there is heavy proteinuria, you may add this. Uh, what is the definition of complete response? Actually, complete response requires a minimum of six months to say that the patient has got uh, a real or a, a complete response. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the problem of lupus is not in the resistance as much as it is in the relapse. I mean, one half of the patient with proliferative lupus who initially achieve a complete response will have a relapse, also called renal flare. Uh, so it is very important to try to decrease this relapse. And uh, remember, when, I, when you start treatment, don't stop early because to get a complete response, you need at least six months of treatment. According to different society, the European and the American society, uh, you can start by treatment with cyclophosphamide, uh, and patients who fail to cyclophosphamide, you give uh, MMF and vice versa. Uh, another option is to use a multi-targeted therapy, which is actually a combination like the one that we are using in transplantation of a CNI like titrolimus, mycophenolate, and steroids. Uh, here we see the history of landmark trials in lupus nephrites. And this history is very interesting. You can uh, see that the Eurolupus protocol will have its uh, anniversary, 21 uh, anniversary. It has been in 2002, uh, which uh, for the first time the, the, uh, proved that uh, the low dose uh, group of uh, cyclophosphamide are comparable to the high dose. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, before that, uh, intravenous missile prednisolone in 1992 uh, uh, has been uh, showed a, a good response. And in 1996, you see that a combination therapy of missile prednisone and cyclophosphamide is, uh, gives a superior result than missile prednisolone alone. After that, there was some progression of addition of MMF uh, and uh, some trial of using uh, rituximab in the lunar in, tw in 2012. Uh, uh, but uh, at that time, the rituximab did not improve the outcome too much. Uh, later on, there were more studies about rituximab. But actually, the three important uh, landmark trials that I will be discussing are those which started from 2018 up to, to 2020 21. Uh, dealing with voclosporin, dealing with bilumumab, and dealing with obinutuzumab. Uh, let's embark and see uh, some of... Uh, th this actually is the, the cartoon that I showed you, but in another way, uh, uh, how uh, the drugs work uh, on the T cell, on the B cell, on the plasma cells, and on the antibodies. So I will not repeat it because it is almost the same. These are actually three important studies, recent studies, Aurora, Bliss, and Nobility. Aurora actually uh, uh, was dealing with voclosporin, which is actually a calcineurin inhibitor. And uh, Bliss is actually dealing with uh, a drug working on the B cell, uh, uh, bilumumab, and Nobility is uh, uh, dealing with uh, the second generation of rituximab, which is called ob obinituzumab. I want you to, to, to concentrate 
on this colon only, which is the difference, the difference between the one year result, the 52 weeks result, between those who were on the standard of care and those who uh, received the drug. So you get a difference of 18% here, a difference of 11% here, and 11 of, uh, a difference of 12% superiority in those who received these three drugs. So there is as, at least from 10 up to almost to 20% improvement uh, after one year when you got uh, these drugs. Also, some of these drugs has been uh, studied up to uh, multiply 52 by two, so it is 104 weeks, I mean two years. Actually, the one that has been studied uh, significantly for two years uh, was uh, the uh, bilumumab uh, uh, and the voclosporin uh, uh, is uh, on study, but it, is not, it did not finish the two, uh, the, the two years yet. Uh, the secondary and post hoc analysis of these three trials uh, showed that, uh, concentrate on the safety here, there is no safety signal beyond the placebo in the three drugs. So they are rather safe to a big extent. And again, uh, the time to separation of the kidney response, I want you to, to separate, uh, to, to look on this second line. Uh, to get a response, uh, you need only two weeks I mean, there is separation of the curve between placebo and voclosporin curve after only two weeks, 15 days from starting the drug and remain separate for the duration of study. However, for the bilumumab, uh, this needs 24 weeks and also for the nobility, 24 weeks. So it seems that voclosporin is actually working very rapidly. Within two weeks, you get the separation while the other drugs are working a little bit uh, slower, and you get again uh, 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 after 24 weeks a separation between the two curves. Therefore, many societies are now putting these drugs in the armamentum. Uh, here, after you give the classic the, uh, steroids, for example, misalprednisolone half gram per day, say for two days, for, followed by the urolupus uh, protocol, cyclophosphamide or MMF, and then after two to three months, if there is no decrease, I, I told you we need to give some time to see if there is a response or not. If there is no decrease in the baseline proteinuria by 25% at least, uh, uh, if there is more, it's okay. If, 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 if there is no improvement, you may go to this new addition. For example, you see here, you can start bilumumab or you can start the voclosporin. The duration of bilumumab, as I told you in the study, it is two years and the duration of voclosporin one year. Uh, and you will combine this with uh, MMF for at least three years from the start of treatment. Is this the, the end of the story? No, there is a fourth drug. I told you about three drugs. Now there is a fourth drug which got an FDA approval, actually acting on the interferon uh, arm here, which a uh, type one interferon blockade, which is called anifrolumab. Uh, this anifrolumab is also uh, an important addition, which got uh, an FDA approval. And there is now another study on the, uh, the lectin pathway of complement using uh, narsoplimab, but it is not finished yet. Uh, unfortunately, the studies of the uh, some uh, drugs working on the uh, uh, place between the uh, antigen-presenting cell and the T cell failed. Uh, so uh, abatacept did not give good re uh, results uh, when added to the background immunosuppression. Uh, 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 does not improve the six or the 12 months complete response rate. Uh, again, as I told you, rituximab fail failed in the first trial and was not useful as an induction agent. However, it does carry potential as a mean to avoid steroid-related adverse events. So later on, there have been two studies, which is the Rituxi Rescue and the Rituxi uh, Loop, may ha also have a role in relapsing or refractory lupus nephritis. So it still could be used, although not initially alone. Obinituzumab, this is, the, as I told you, the type 2 anti-CD20, 
Actually, this drug was a drug for the chronic lymphatic leukemia, but nowadays the lupus uh, patient could benefit from it because this drug given in a dose of around one gram on day one, day 15, and after six months. Uh, so it's very convenient to give this injection from time to time and resulted in clinically meaningful benefit uh, that is, was sustained uh, for uh, through the week 76, more than one year. You see the complete renal response in the arm using the drug in blue is much higher than the placebo in gray. Uh, uh, and uh, also all the parameters, the complement uh, C3, C4, anti-double-stranded DNA, and the urinary protein creatinine ratio, all are better, much better in the uh, obinutuzumab plus MMF versus placebo plus MMF. And the summary uh, of the side effect, you see the adverse uh, uh, effects are almost very comparable in the arm of uh, the drug uh, versus the arm of placebo. Uh, even here, you can see astonishingly that in the placebo arm, the mortality is a little bit higher here, 7%, and here is 2%. Uh, what about voclosporin? And these are the first trial of voclosporin. Unfortunately, the first the first trial uh, showed a little bit increase in the mortality, and th therefore this drug was a little bit higher rate of adverse event, including death, were observed in the in the early study. But after some follow up by uh, other investigator, they found that this is not very uh, important. And uh, there is the primary endpoint and the secondary endpoint of uh, have been attained versus the placebo. And uh, this ended by uh, the voclosporin getting the FDA approval. And as I told you, it starts very early, very early within two weeks, you may start to see the difference. Uh, so it is much rapid than the other uh, weapons used for lupus. Uh, and here, uh, these are the subgroup analysis uh, of this drug. Uh, what about the Bilumumab? This is the Bliss study that I told you, two-year randomized control trial in lupus nephritis. And uh, it again, it is given intravenous, initial 10 milligram per kg, intravenous every two weeks for three doses, uh, and then maintenance 10 milligram per kg intravenous every four weeks. So these drugs are very convenient for the uh, long-term use. And also, this drug has the advantage. It has been released in the market, and it, it, it has the advantage of being given also subcutaneous. You may give it subcutaneous uh, with uh, initial 400 milligram, then maintenance 200 milligram subcutaneous every week. Uh, again, in this uh, BLISS trial, you see uh, uh, verse, uh, the, uh, the line favoring bilumumab in all the groups. Uh, versus the placebo, and this is uh, very interesting and uh, coping with the histology. Uh, how this voclosporin work? It, it works by calcium urine mediates dephosphorylation of the synaptocodon, make it susceptible to catepsin mediated degradation, and uh, synaptobotin is critical for stabilizing the actin cytoskeleton. How bilumumab work? The, uh, here it again. Uh, uh, by pro uh, it is protective for the tubular interstitium with preservation of the podocyte integrity, which translates to better long-term maintenance of kidney function. Uh, here, uh, the results of the uh, has been published in the American Society of Nephrology that both the drug has been approved, voclosporin and milupab for the treatment of active lupus, and it seems that. Uh, I showed you this curve uh, that they could be used in those patients who do, who do not uh, uh, get a 25 degrees in the baseline protein. Uh, is this the end of the story? At the end of both trial, over 50% of the lupus nephritis patient has not achieved complete response or partial response. And still, we need uh, a room for more drugs to be uh, included. This is the uh, safnilo or the an anifrolumab that I told you will work on type 1 interferon receptor. Again, it got in August 2021 another FDA approval after two important studies called the MUSE and the TULIP study. And it is given intravenous at 300 milligram vial 
for uh, treating moderate to severe lupus. And this is actually the same uh, figure that I showed you. Now let's go to the KDGO guideline. This is the last part of my talk. The KDGO guideline published in uh, last uh, in March 2023. Actually, it was a modification of chapter 10 uh, of the uh, publication in 2021. Uh, here, uh, they are telling that the approach to the diagnosis in systemic lupus patient uh, testing is indicated. Then, uh, you, you, of course, you will go with the classic uh, measurement of serum creatinine, protein excretion, uh, serology anti double stranded DNA and complement. And then uh, these are, they didn't mention anything about the new biomarker, which is still under investigation. So it is not yet included in the KDGO guideline. But they added here that uh, recommended that patients with lupal, uh, lupus should be seen as uh, those with lupus should be treated with hydroxychloroquine or an equivalent anti-malarial and less contraindicated. And uh, the evidence is, uh, here is 1C. Uh, so, uh, so now hydroxychloroquine is an important uh, weapon in the management of uh, our lupus uh, nephritis patient. Uh, again, it is very important to, to see the patient as a whole, his cardiovascular risk, infection risk, so cardiovascular risk, uh, risk needs lifestyle modification, dyslipidemia management, low-dose aspirin during pregnancy, uh, infection risk, and including, for example, the vaccination, uh, uh, taking care of the bone mineral density uh, and avoiding fracture, especially if the patient is on steroid, uh, even uh, calcium and vitamin D supplementation and bisphosphonate when appropriate, ultraviolet light exposure, this is important, uh, limit the ultraviolet light exposure, which may exacerbate the skin affection of lupus, uh, premature ovarian failure, uh, and unplanned pregnancy, especially if the patient is on uh, MMF or cyclophosphamide, it could be dangerous. And again, cancer evaluate individual risk factor for malignancies. This is important. For class one and class two lupus, the immunosuppressive treatment guided by extrarenal manifestation and consider maintenance combination with low-dose glucocorticosteroid. For class 3 or class 4 lupus, the recommendation here is uh, to start one of the following. Here they started to integrate the new drugs. You see mycophenolic acid analogs, low-dose intravenous cyclophosphamide, or bilumumab. So bilumumab here, first time appear in the KDGO guideline. Uh, uh, and either with uh, MPA with mycophenolic acid or with low dose intravenous cyclosamide uh, or calcineurin inhibitor. And here they are ma ma mentioning the calcineurin inhibitor, whether tacrolimus or voclosporin, which is another uh, drug in this respect. Uh, here uh, they are telling that MPA based regimen is the preferred initial therapy of proliferative lupus at high risk of infertility. Patients who have a moderate to high prior, uh, especially those in the Childbearing age, it is not very nice to give them cyclophosphamide in big doses. Uh, a triple immunosuppressive uh, regimen of bilumumab with glucocorticoids and either MPA or reduced cyclophosphamide may be considered in patients with repeated renal flare. So it has got uh, an important role here. Other therapies such as azathioprine or leflunamide combined with steroid may be considered in lieu of the recommended initial drug for proliferative lupus. And newer biological and non-biological therapy are under development. They are mentioning that uh, rituximab may be considered for patients with persistent disease activity. And they did not mention the obinutuzumab, but they are, uh, of course, it is a, a sort of improvement of the rituximab. Glucocorticoids should be tapered to the lowest possible dose during maintenance, except when glucocorticoids are required for extra lupus manifestation. The dose of MMF in the early maintenance is approximately 750 to 1 gram twice daily. And then uh, it should, the duration of treatment is up to three years. This is very important because you may give a short uh, duration uh, treatment of MMF and you don't, and you stop after that, which is not very effective in the control. Uh, and this is an example of the maintenance immunosuppression of lupus. For class five lupus, uh, the KDGO recommends 
that, uh, as I told you, renin angiosystem system blockade is very important. Immunosuppression, uh, hydroxychloroquine will be given and uh, immunosuppressive treatment guided by the extra renal manifestation of systemic lupus. Uh, and here is the definition of complete response, partial response, or, uh, or no affection of the kidney. And we, we mentioned this in the early st studies. Uh, and this is an algorithm when you find that the patient is not responding. Uh, verify he is adherent to treatment because maybe he's not taking the medication adequately. Ensure adequate doses of the immunosuppressive medication by measuring the plasma drug level, which is very rarely done in case of mycophenolate. Repeat biopsy if concerned for chronicity or other diagnosis. Maybe, you know, lupus patient may have thrombotic microangiopathy, which may uh, necessitate other lines of treatment, including plasma exchange. Consider switching to an alternative first line when there is persistent disease activity. And consider the following in patient with refractory to the first line treatment and here addition of rituximab or other biological therapy. Extend the courses of Dravina's pulse cyclosomide and enroll in clinical trial that is still ongoing for lupus. Uh, this is thrombotic microangiopathy. And of course, here anticoagulation and plasma exchange may be added as lines of treatment. And they are giving a, a short paragraph of about treatment of lupus nephritis in children. Treat pediatric with lupus nephritis using immunosuppression regimen similar to those used in adult, but consider issues relevant to this population, such as dose adjustment, growth, fertility, and psychosocial factor when deciding the therapy plan. And uh, lupus uh, uh, with pregnancy also is important. This is a presentation it was given by Danielle Shen in Hong Kong in uh, the during the kidney uh, in the kidney international during the WCN 2022, uh, putting that uh, after uh, giving the trial of steroid, you may uh, use calcineurin inhibitor, including voclosporin here or tacrolimus. You may uh, use uh, B lymphocyte targeting biology like bilumumab that I told you about. Uh, and in addition, of course, to the classic treatment of cyclophosphamide and microphenolate, which should be continued for a reasonably uh, long time. Uh, to finish, I will give you the top 10 uh, KDGO uh, hints uh, about takeaway messages. Diagnosis of lupus, early diagnosis, and timely treatment are important to preserve the nephron and avoid the deterioration. Uh, and decrease, of course, the number of flare. Anti-malarial therapy is recommended for all patients if there is no contraindication. Class one and, and two lupus, you give less immunosuppression. Initial immunosuppression for active class three and four uh, is uh, leukocorticoid plus either mycophenolic or low-dose urolupus intravenous cyclophosphamide, according to this figure one. Uh, Steroid dosing should be tapered. Nowadays, you are not in the era of high dose steroid. Emerging data suggests that lower dose may be equally effective. Uh, following initial therapy of proliferative lupus, mycophenolate is the preferred immunosuppression and should be continued for three years, at least three, uh, 36 months, as you see here in figure two. Class five lupus is managed with resplogate, blood pressure optimization, hydroxychloroquine, addition of immunosuppression, in patient only who develop nephrotic range of proteinuria, and satisfactory response to treatment, you will go to the curve that I showed you, and considering the new drug adherence, for example, repeat the biopsy, et cetera, and the stage kidney disease, you don't give immunosuppression anymore. You just me uh, measure the patient, uh, manage the patient as and, and the stage kidney disease, and when there is total fibrosis, you may go for transplantation. Pregnancy in patient with lupus, Good pregnancy outcome require pre-pregnancy counseling and planning. Pregnancy should be avoided when lupus is active or when patients are exposed to potentially teratogenic medication. This is a nice uh, cartoon uh, that has been uh, mentioned uh, that you need to talk to the patient about, uh, there is an individualized uh, uh, treatment about the infection risk, cardiovascular and bone health, fertility, uh, treatment adherence, so it is important in this personalized holistic management between the patient and the doctor. And you will give him relevant information from the kidney biopsy, will guide you about uh, how to go to give steroid alone, to give immunosuppression, and which one, 
and to give adjunctive therapy uh, in addition to, of course, to tight control of the blood pressure, renal protective measure, minimize vascular risk factor, including dyslipidemia and lifestyle uh, points. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Prof. Hafez. This was a very detailed talk, and thank you for also for highlighting the, the new KDGO guideline on the management of lupus nephritis. I would like to invite the audience for the Q&A session, and uh, you're welcome to use the chat box, the regular one, and the Q&A chat box to post questions for Prof. Hafez that we will read out loud. Uh, please also feel free to raise your hand up, uh, the attendees or the panelists. Please feel free to unmute yourself and ask Prof. Hafez a question. I'll start off with a question from uh, Dr. Joseph Narendra from Rwanda. He's a senior consultant nephrologist there. And uh, his question was that uh, a half gram of protein to decide if renal biopsy is indicated, does it mean that, uh, uh, that it should be a 24-hour protein excretion? Uh, Prof. Hafez, could you respond to that? Uh, I mean... Uh... Uh, uh, whether is it an albumin creatinine ratio or a it, it is a 24 hour? This is the question. I think both both will come to the same. I mean, if you have significant uh, proteinuria, you will go for biopsy. And if it is non-significant, whether you measure uh, by albumin creatinine ratio or by 24 hour, if it is non-significant, according to this cartoon that I, uh, I, I showed, uh, a biopsy could be delayed. Uh, Dr. Narendra, I hope that answers your question, but please feel free to unmute yourself uh, for further clarification as you're on the panel. Uh, we'll no, no, I, I, I'm satisfied. Well, so, you know, thank you very much, Professor Hafez. Thank you very much, Professor Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Narendra. Uh, so we have uh, two questions on the on the Q&A chat box, and uh, the first one is from Michael, and it says... Uh, that the algorithm the algorithm suggests that uh, we should wait uh, uh, with the usual two or three uh, with the with the usual drugs for two or three months before starting the new new ones. Could there be an indication where we can start uh, with the new drugs from the outset, especially with uh, the fast effect of volcosporin? The the problem uh, with these drugs uh, in our area in our continent in Africa that these drugs are still not uh, very available uh, now. So I don't think that. We will go uh, uh, as a first uh, line. Even you see in the KDGO guideline, they were very uh, conservative, telling that uh, you may use them in cases of resistant cases. So it will uh, uh, the definition of resistant cases is patient in which uh, you you uh, you gave me, uh, all the alternatives and they did not respond. So I think uh, yes, if you have a patient that you, you label resistant and you tried everything, you may start from the start, yes. But uh, uh, don't, go, don't rush to these, uh, of, of course, interesting drugs and uh, given intravenous and given in a way in which you are sure that the patient is adherent and compliant, uh, but still the price of these drugs, of course, will be a little bit high higher than the classic uh, uh, protocols that we are using, still cyclophosphamide, still urolupus protocol, uh, still uh, the triple therapy with uh, tacrolimus and uh, MMF and steroid, all these are maybe cheaper uh, starts. Then you can, if there is resistance, you can uh, go for uh, voclosporin or bilumumab, which is now available in some uh, countries uh, in the era in the area uh, I saw it in the uh, United uh, Emirates, for example, and in Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. It's already marketed, and outside Europe and the United States. And uh, yes, we can use this. But if you label the patient very resistant. Oh, thank you very much, Prof. And uh, in continuity, there is a, a question from uh, Dr. Ben Dr. Ben Lomate that uh, would you need a renal biopsy before using the newer drugs, or only is proteinuria? enough and uh, enough indication and uh, how would you use them and uh, which what is the choice of the drug uh, uh, you would choose and and add to the standard of care and would you use them before a relapse would happen uh, thank you there are uh, so uh, many questions together <laughs> so the oh. first the first question is that uh, i need yes i need a biopsy for a every patient of lupus at least once because uh, as you see uh, this is uh, the as long as we are not using the new biomarkers, still uh, biopsy is the uh, golden way 
to, to know which stage we are. So I, I, every patient will, will have uh, one biopsy. If we go to the era of uh, biomarkers of activity or of resistance uh, to, to therapy, maybe, yes, we will not uh, uh, repeat biopsy. At that time, I know that the patient is resistant. He will not respond. Uh, so I will not repeat the biopsy. I can go uh, and measure one of the urinary biomarkers that I mentioned. This is the first question. The second question, uh, which uh, I think is uh, in, my, in my personal uh, preference, uh, the one that used soon. I think uh, the second generation of uh, uh, rituximab, which is uh, according to the nobility trial or obinituzumab, or, uh, has been already mar uh, marketed and it has been used in cases of antibody-mediated rejection in kidney transplantation. So uh, as nephrologists, you will find it uh, and I, 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 you will give uh, I, 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 under the name of Gaziva, and it will be given in uh, in two doses uh, spaced by two to three weeks between the two doses. In resistant cases, I think this is uh, carrying a, a very low uh, spectrum of side effects, and it is uh, feasible. It is like rituximab, but it is more effective. This is my my best choice, followed by. Bilumumab, because bilumumab also has got the advantage of being given subcutaneous. So you may give also, I, I will I, I avoid the voclosporin for two reasons. Because the initial reports of voclosporin showed increased mortality, although they, they denied it in later studies. And uh, the use of voclosporin in most of studies is, has been followed for only one year, not two years, for example, as compared to bilumumab. So my first choice will be obinituzumab, and my second choice will be bilumumab. And the third question from the same uh, from the same uh, doctor is: uh, Can we start them before a relapse happens? Uh, 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 how how uh, you will expect that there uh, there will be a relapse as long as you don't have uh, markers? So uh, the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed Tahir, a senior consultant nephrologist from uh, from Kenya, has a question. Uh, Dr. Tahir, welcome. Dr. Tahir, how are you? Assalamu alaikum, Prof. Alaykum nice salam. to hear how from you. you? <laughs> very oh, nice to a see pleasure. you. Thank you very much. Uh, nice to, to see you. And happy Eid. Happy Eid. Yes, <laughs> celebrating on Saturday in Kenya. Uh, very uh, I think uh, in, in Egypt it will be tomorrow, maybe. <laughs> Inshallah. Inshallah. Okay. Uh, I've got a practical question, Prof. When you're monitoring your patients with lupus nephritis, uh, what markers do you use? Do you use complements? Do you use anti double stranded DNA? Do you just use proteinuria? Uh, what makes you know your patient is doing well or not doing well or when there's a relapse? Uh, I, according to uh, what we have up to now, before, of course, these uh, new biomarkers that I, I, I mentioned. Uh, I will depend on the consumption of the complement, uh, on the positivity of the anti-double-stranded uh, uh, DNA, which is usually present. Uh, and I will uh, depend also on the decrease uh, of, uh, of the total uh, leukocytic count. Uh, I will depend on uh, the active, active sediments in the urine. I mean, uh, 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 there will be not only proteinuria, but maybe uh, uh, hematuria, cos, I mean, many things in the urine showing that there is a, a, a more active sediments in the urine. And of course, in some patients, you will have uh, increase in the serum creatinine or the serum cystatin, uh, especially those with proliferative uh, lupus type 4. Thank you, Dr. Tahir, for your question. Uh... We have a question from Dr. Lloyd, and he, Prof. Hafez, he would uh, request your take on the step-down therapy uh, for stable lupus uh, patients who are doing well. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Lloyd. The, the problem is that uh, we physicians, uh, we are usually uh, uh, very enthusiastic in stopping the treatment early. <laughs> I mean, we don't 
we don't go to the recommendation of the KDGO. You see, the KDGO are recommending that MMF is continued for three years. And I'm afraid that very few of us will keep the patient on MMF for three years. <laughs> Usually when you find the patient in complete response, I told you the complete response takes six months to one year, right? So usually when you find the patient is nice, you start to, uh, to decrease the dose uh, uh, markedly or me, uh, even to stop. And at that time, you may get a flare or a renal flare or a, 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 a relapse, as I told you. So my recommendation is if you are on MMF, don't stop uh, totally. Keep even in small, on small dose and try to adhere to the KDGO guideline of fulfilling the three years uh, period. Uh, the recommendation now regarding the steroid is that you may use the the the, the least dose of steroid, uh, maybe 10, uh, 10, 5 to 10 milligram, like what you are using in transplantation. So uh, I think the maintenance with a very small dose of steroid and a, sm a small dose of MMF, but continuing for three years will an answer Dr. Leroy's question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. So there's a very uh, a very good and practical question in the chat box, and uh, it, it, the, the the person asking is asking your experience with uh, a multi-targeted uh, therapy as compared to a monotherapy with just MMF or a CNI, and which, in your opinion, would have a better outcome? And would you, right off the bat, consider a multi-targeted therapy over just a monotherapy in this case? Uh, my answer actually is. I will not go to the multi-targeted in the sense of three drugs, but I will go to the two drugs because as I, uh, as I mentioned in the history of lupus trials, they started by saying that if you give only steroid, uh, it is worse than uh, combining steroid with, with cyclophosphamide or its improvement, which is now MMF. So if you give two drugs, it's better than one drug. So I will go for two drugs steroid and MMF. And I will not go to add a third drug, which is a, a tacrolimus, for example, or its modification, which will be the voclosporin, uh, except if the patient does not have rise of creatinine, because you are aware that these drugs by themselves, they may lead to some uh, uh, spasm in or, or uh, vasoconstriction in the uh, blood supply of the glomerulus and may lead to rise of serum creatinine. And we, this is a phenomenon that we may encounter in uh, in cyclosporin or in tacrolimus toxicity. So I will not go uh, to targeted therapy in a patient in which uh, who started to have decrease in the GFR or, or rise in the creatinine. So I will be satisfied by keeping on two drugs, not three drugs. Thank you very much, Prof. And uh... Uh, there's one question by Dr. Mazar Amir Ali. He's from Tanzania. He's a nephrologist. And uh, uh, again, a very practical question that, uh, you know, on the your take on rebiopsying a patient uh, with lupus nephritis. So would you rebiopsy a previously successfully treated class 4 lupus nephritis patient who is currently having a renal flare with an active urinary sediment and especially with the cost factor, factor involved with uh, the renal biopsy and the histopath uh, along with it? Uh, would it be safe to treat uh, this as a uh, as a proliferative uh, lupus patient uh, empirically? Yes, yes, I, I agree on that. Uh, if the patient has been diagnosed as type four before uh, proliferative, and now he has an active urinary sed sediment and criteria of activity, I will not re-biopsy. I will go as straightforward for the treatment. Uh, maybe I, I I will biopsy if it is less degree, and now. Uh, Having, yeah, for example, has been diagnosed as class two, and then now he has uh, more activity or more rise of creatinine. At that time, yes, I would uh, re, re biopsy because at that time I am thinking that the pathology has changed. He's no more in class one or two, and he now is in a more serious class, or maybe he has some uh, uh, micro, uh, I mean, uh, thrombotic microangiopathy or another factor that may necessitate another line of treatment. So at that time, I will biopsy. But if diagnosed initially at type 4, I will not biopsy, be biopsy. Yeah, that was very clear, Prof. Uh, you've already answered this question for Dr. Lloyd. However, there is a bit of an addition uh, on the duration of the therapy uh, for the management of lupus. Uh, in this case, a, a class 5 lupus patient uh, who is in complete remission 
the maintenance part has been answered, but would you actually biopsy this patient before stopping the medication? Or would you just depend on the on the biomarkers in this case? Of course, if the biomarkers are available, I will prefer them, especially the urine biomarkers. Mm -hmm. And that is great. And uh, a very interesting question from Congo here, that can you explain the genetic factors in lupus nephritis with uh, susceptibility with the female sex? Yeah, they, uh, they, I think I started by uh, trying to explain that uh, uh, the load, the load of the genes responsible for lupus will be a double hit in female uh, versus male because uh, they are thinking that some of these will be present on the X chromosome. So they are attributing, th this is one of the theories that um, females are more uh, affected because they are affected by the genes uh, responsible for the T cell, for the interferon uh, alpha and uh, for all these, uh, you will have more genes uh, among the 80 genes classified uh, responsible for lupus uh, in the female side uh, rather than the male side. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. And then there is one more question. Uh, uh, what is your take? Uh, what, in your opinion, uh, sets uh, Volcus warning apart from the other CNIs? I mean, uh, the point is that maybe uh, the result of the uh, study the Aurora trial, that's all. I mean, the, there have been uh, no no uh, trial uh, for lupus uh, by tacronymus or uh, no trial uh, by cyclosporin. So I don't, I, I, I'm, I, I, and, there, uh, and therefore the, uh, the, the multi-targeted therapy, which uses tacronymus as one of the three drugs is actually using tacronymus, which is a calcineurin inhibitor also and, and getting good results. So I think if they make a trial like the Aurora uh, with tacrolimus, they may get uh, similar uh, similar benefits. Yeah. I'm not very enthusiastic for Buclosporin because uh, if you read the initial the initial data of Aurora in 2019, you'll find that there is increased risk of mortality. But this never appeared in the in the follow up. Uh, 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 studies uh, uh, that got the approval of FDA. I don't know why. Hmm. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. And you'd be happy to know that finally someone has brought up a question on renal transplant. So is there a place for renal transplant in, in end-stage renal disease for lupus patients? Yes, definitely, definitely. We are transplanting actually in Egypt uh, uh, many patients uh, with the original diagnosis of lupus. You know that their age uh, are usually... Uh, young or middle-aged females and of course they are very enthusiastic to have a good uh, outcome of pregnancy so treatment uh, by dialysis alone is not enough for them and they are seeking to go for transplantation but uh, we take uh, the measures that uh, we don't uh, uh, go except when there is uh, as we assume that there is complete fibrosis or uh, uh, I mean, the, the activities are very, very uh, minimal, and the patient is at least for, uh, on, uh, uh, on dialysis for not less than six months to, to be assured that uh, the remaining nephron are, are, are fibrosed and uh, will not have a flare after the transplantation. And as I mentioned, the, the multi-targeted therapy used is actually the same protocol that we are giving in transplantation. So yes, the, the answer, I, I am enthusiastic to transplant these patients when they don't have flare. I thank you very much, Prof. I, my apologies for missing a question in between uh, all the others that, uh, uh, there's a question on the withdrawal of steroids in uh, end-state kidney disease in lupus patients. So what would your take on that be? <clears throat> uh, if the patient uh, is already on end-stage, I mean, he started dialysis, if it yes. is, yes. if it, if it started dialysis, yes. Uh, uh, as as long as uh, there is no other reason for maintaining a small dose of steroid. I mean, if the patient, for example, does not get uh, uh, other signs of activity of systemic lupus disease in general, arthritis, for example, or uh, uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, or I, I mean, uh, I, I mean the other uh, rheumatology side. It does not need a small dose of steroid for controlling uh, the extra renal manifestation. But if it is only for renal manifestation, yes, I will stop the steroid.
And uh, so, sorry, Prof, I know we're running out of time, but I'll just uh, allow one more question. So there's a question on the preemptive transplant in uh, in SLE patients. Uh, what would your take on that be? Uh, as I told you, I'm a, a little bit uh, afraid of that because I, I, if the if I am sure if I am sure that the patient and it's very difficult to be sure that the patient will not get uh, uh, I mean a, a flare or I mean still there is um, uh, room for a recurrent activity. I will not. I will wait until there is complete fibrosis and the patient is on dialysis for some time to be sure that it is for the, the original kidney are, are fibrosed uh, and I, at that time I will go for transplantation. But suppose that uh, there is a mixture or acute on top of chronic, for example, and this creatinine is around six because of activity, and now you go for transplanting a patient and you are uh, faced with. with uh, a renal flare uh, of lupus, this will make the outcome of transplantation not very good. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Hafez. Uh, I think this has been a very engaging discussion. And uh, uh, this is one of those things I, I feel most of us have to go back to the literature for while we are treating our patients. And uh, we're lucky to have had such a, li a good live session with you as, comp as opposed to the recording as initially planned. Uh, I would like to also thank the ISN for, again, uh, facilitating such a high-quality presentation. And, of course, Prof. Hafiz, to you for taking your time out, uh, especially when it was uh, time to break your fast to be with us and then talk to us. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, yes. You. So a recording, a recording of this talk will be available on YouTube, as uh, our prior, all of our previous talks are. Uh, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Africa Healthcare Network Fireside Chats. This chat should be available by Monday or Tuesday next week. Uh, hopefully, we won't need to go back running to our books because we can watch this video and learn everything all over again. Thanks to Prof. Hafiz.